My name is Laura Evans. I'm the Director of National State Policy with Vibrant Emotional Health. It's my pleasure uh, to um, host this jam today. Uh, we've got a really great featured presentation from Dr. Eric Raffalayan, who I had the pleasure to work with before, right after the State of the Union, where there was mention of mental health. I think this is uh, going to be amazing. So let's get started. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, we're always thinking about emergency medical, how that may relate to uh, the work that we're doing in suicide prevention, making sure that the systems have what they need. So it's just a bit of a, a slide set here for you all. And of course, the behavioral health side, that care traffic control, we've got our uh, phenomenal trained uh, lifeline crisis counselors, uh, crisis stabilization, mobile crisis, and, and the work doing that is being done now by you all to help build this out. So let's just keep it moving. All right, and of course, the JAM, uh, we have uh, over 70 national organizations, including Vibrant, SAMHSA, NASHBED, uh, others participating. If you don't see your name on the list here and your organization uh, is not represented, please uh, reach out, put it in the chat or reach out to Karen Jones. We'll make sure that you get listed. And of course, just thinking through the participation, we still have our uh, high watermark with the special youth edition uh, that happened early in January. But you know, the tech uh, edition that happened last week is getting up there in views. And I think this just goes to show that uh, every week, uh, the learning uh, community here at, at the Crisis Jam just gets bigger and stronger and the topics become uh, more nuanced and complex and we really get to spend time diving deep. So if you can't join us live or in person, please make sure to check it out on Zoom. Uh, next slide. And then if this has disappeared from your calendar, you can make sure that uh, you can download it uh, and another series will stay on so that you don't ever miss a week. Next slide. And of course, uh, you can go to talk.crisisnow.com to get more information. Of course, we have the Zoom link right there. You can sign up for the weekly newsletter, view materials from past, uh, crisis jams, get your shirt, get your hat. Uh, you can get virtual backgrounds. And then of course, we have the various segments broken out in case you were looking for what was that hot seat question from two weeks ago. Um, you can find it very easily. Next slide. All right, so we're talking about latest crisis news. Uh, I was joking before this that uh, I, I'm getting older because I saw this image and I, I thought immediately of a record player, uh, but that's actually a, a camera. And this article from the Washington Post was about AI and the role of AI in uh, mental health and mental health crises. Um, and so the article is essentially making the point that we're not quite there yet. Um, you know, sort of like, uh, I think Karen made the analogy of Tesla and the driving cars, right? Self-driving cars, great in concept, but we're not quite there where we don't have to um, help drive it. Uh, so again, really important as we think through safety and response. And of course, after the crisis jam last week with Google, you know, I think there are just ways that we can leverage uh, AI when we talk about mental health and crises, but we also want to make sure that um, it uh, kind of meets the mark that we're all expecting. So good article. Make sure to check it out if you haven't already. And here I'll just um, uh, make a note to highlight uh, Pooja Mehta, uh, who I've had the pleasure to meet. She is amazing. She took this picture here in DC uh, of uh, a 988 and crisis, crisis and suicide lifeline uh, kind of placard on a uh, street here. And so we would love to see images of this. We've seen it featured on buses. Please email Karen um, or reach out if you have seen these in your community. We want to keep note. Uh, and oftentimes these are um, an act of either the state or locality in putting these up. So if you're aware of those, uh, please also share that information. We want to make sure that we are checking it. 
Oh, nice. Connecticut Avenue. I got to, I got to, it's been a while since I've been over there. Um, and then our quote this week, I won't read it to you. It's there on the screen, but it comes from uh, Sherry Lowell, who's the VP of the California Hospital Association. And again, just highlighting what we all know, right, that hospital EDs may not be the most appropriate place for folks who are in crisis. Um, so this is her quote. And I will keep us moving because we just have so much information today. And I want to get you over to Dr. Eric Raffala Yan, who you many of you may know, who was a fellow in uh, Representative Cardenas's office. Um, and so he is going to be our future presentation. So I will turn it over to you, Eric. Thanks, Laura. Uh, good to see folks this morning. Um, as Laura said, my name is Eric Raffala Yan. I'm a psychiatrist um, previously in the Congressman Tony Cardenas's office where we worked on the 980 Implementation Act and a number of appropriating pieces, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but here today now to talk about some history. And so this is a slide that I'm sure many of you have used in some version in some conversation you've had at some point um, about to talking about, well, what is the difference how we think about responding to mental health emergencies versus other medical emergencies where we have a robust system? And so the answer to this question is typically, well, you would call EMS or you would call 911 and they would dispatch EMS. Next slide. And, and so then the, the following question is, well, why don't we, we have that for other kinds of emergencies that involve the brain? And so the reason for this is actually a combination of things, which I think you'll find very, very relevant towards what's happening today with the 90-day system and the, and the crisis continuum of care. Um, but what some folks don't know, and uh, I myself did not know until a few years ago when I was looking more into this, was we didn't always have 911 in emergency medical systems. I think a lot of people just kind of assume that it had been around for a long time and it just sort of sort of is there, but really it was a lot of advocacy, a lot of research, a, a lot of things that went into this. And so before the 1960s and 1970s in most places, um, you couldn't count on an ambulance response. In fact, most ambulances didn't even exist and we'll get into that in more detail. But who responded when you called your local emergency number, which may not be 911, um, was that police or funeral home staff responded to emergencies simply because they had the vehicles. And the concept that people needed medical care outside of the hospital were, were, were sort of patients, that was foreign concept. So really it was incumbent upon those individuals to get themselves to the hospital to get the care that they needed. Next slide, please. And so, well, this is kind of a, a complicated slide and we'll get to it in a, in a little bit later on as well, but I just wanted to leave an outline for you all here. Um, we're going to start there at the top and go into more detail in 1966 with the National Academy of Sciences report. And then we'll also talk just a little bit about Freedom House, and um, then we'll talk some about the legislation that followed. Next slide, please. Yeah, and I have a number of slides, and so I'm going to go through them kind of quickly, so hopefully we can get to some of the important parts. Um, I did want to call out the contributions of the Freedom House Ambulance Service, um, which was a, a Black-run ambulance service that was developed in the Hill District of Pittsburgh, um, specifically because individuals in that area weren't able to get emergency aid. And so if they called their local emergency number or the police department, they just couldn't, simply couldn't get people to respond. And so they partnered with academics and physicians at the University of Pittsburgh to develop the standards, which now are the standards that we use today. And really have individuals that are trained um, in providing resuscitation, providing um, triage in the field, have the equipment that they need to be successful and the ability to transfer these individuals in crisis or in the time of heart attack, stroke, et cetera, um, to, to a hospital or a place where they can get further care. Next slide, please. And so this is another busy slide, but, but we'll see it again later on. And really the point of this slide is to show that it's been an evolution over time on the EMS side, and we're going to see similar things on the 988 side. And so now we'll get into more detail on that 1966 report. So this report, the accidental death, accidental death and disability, the neglected disease in modern society. So this was really a landmark report that led to the development of the EMS system as, as we know and rely on today. 
So it was published in 1966 um, after three years of development. Um, it's a federally funded report that was spearheaded by a number of committees and councils under the National Academy of Sciences. Um, it's actually online. It's 39 pages. It's freely available. So the, the link is in there if folks want to check it out. Next slide, please. The, um, so it had a number of conclusions, a number of findings, a number of recommendations. So I'm not going to read through all 39 pages, but wanted to highlight some of the most important and relevant parts, I think, for us in Miami Day in crisis care today. Um, so really, one of its findings after three years of work, and the, they had um, both surveys of public and professionals, they interfaced with government agencies, they interfaced with state actors, federal actors, so they really did a fairly comprehensive um, work over this three-year period. And they found that both the public and government were insensitive, was the word that they used, and to the magnitude of the problem of accidental death and injury. And uh, one impetus for this was the development of interstate highways and individuals who were in car accidents at an increasingly high number and were not able to get medical care in time and so died instead um, on the highway or before they got care. And there were some a number of more highly publicized cases about this as well. Um, another finding was that standards for ambulance services were very, very variable and typically low, and that really was generous. And, We'll talk a little bit more about that, but a, a quote from that. So if there were ambulances that they were unsuitable, they didn't have equipment, they didn't really have supplies, and they were mostly manned by untrained individuals. And so the report came away with five major recommendations. And so one was to convene national forums on emergency medical services, two, to establish a national trauma association, to reorganize community councils, on emergency medical services with lay and professional stakeholder groups, um, form a national council on accident prevention to, to create a national institute of trauma under the US Public Health Service. We'll talk a little bit more about those details and how they parallel a little bit of what we're seeing with 988. Next slide, please. So the national conferences on emergency medical services were really envisioned as a sort of a professional-led um, conference and convening for uh, medical leadership to distribute sort of best practices um, and really uh, help push the field forward. Because another thing too uh, at this time, and uh, I came on that timeline, was that the emergency medicine specialty um, really was in its infancy, or in most places there were not training programs for this. And so there was really identified a need to push the academic learning and, and training in this area. And, and a joint goal of this was to increase public awareness around it. Um, the second one is the establishment of a national trauma association. And so this was envisioned as a sort of a public facing national association to really continue a lot of that work of distributing best practices, evidence building public awareness, and really having that kind of um, connection to an ongoing association that would help continue those those ideals and, and those goals. And it was also a public facing association. So this was really like, you know, if you went and you wanted to know who was doing the work in this area, you could go to this association to find out. Um, an organization of community councils. And so something that I think was really interesting, this was one of the kind of more in, like, original things about this report was the identification that Although this was a national initiative, it really needed to be implemented at a local level. And so they recommended that in each community, coordination of lay and professional responsibilities for emergency medical care should be centralized in a council on emergency services. And this is somewhat similar to what we're seeing now with 988, where we have local conveners in you know, most major counties, major cities, states, of uh, those that partners of crisis response uh, facilities, the crisis call counselors, uh, the um, mobile crisis teams, perhaps law enforcement, EMS, and perhaps local healthcare clinics or emergency rooms. So we're really seeing that again today. And back then in 1966, it was envisioned to bring together those local resources, expertise, and, and con importantly, consensus in communities about how these were going to respond. And they called out a couple of uh, specific bodies that they thought um, were important to include in that. <clears throat> The um, I won't read all that, but just one thing I thought was interesting is that they have they have the Boy Scouts in there, and one of the reasons for this was that first aid and CPR were also brand newer in their infancy, and they envisioned that um, 
promotion of these first aid techniques to the general public was going to be an important piece of this as well. Next slide, please. The, the formation of a, of a National Council on Accident Prevention. So this was very forward thinking of them. They, they identified that their report was primarily concerned with emergency care immediately after the injury, but that there needed to be more research and implementation for accident prevention in the first place. And so this is also relevant to the work that we're doing with 988 and of course this continuum of care, uh, recognizing that while the continuum is important, wraparound service that what happens before and after the immediate crisis are perhaps just as important, if not more important. And the, we also need to focus on that in addition to the specific focus on the new rollout of 988. But, um, another interesting, um, so, so, sorry, can I go back one quickly to that quote? Um, an interesting piece here was that they recommended that previously um, uh, passed laws and statutes be sort of gone over again to see if it could be justified under those previously passed laws um, that different government departments that already existed had administrative responsibility in accident prevention. And so I think this is a place where, where there's room to grow on, on the mental health side. We're seeing a little bit of this with the Department of Justice. Um, ruling that access to, to mental health care is a um, uh, covered under uh, various rights and that the inability to access care and, or to have less restrictive um, measures of care besides police uh, may be in violation of the ADA. And so this is, I think, a place where in mental health we have more room to grow and to see that how can we utilize existing laws um, to make sure that, that people get the benefit that they're entitled to. Um, next slide, please. Thanks. <clears throat> and then the creation of a National Institute of Trauma. And so this really was um, a recognized the role that was needed for federal leadership and to have a permanent home for this in the federal government that involved not just the leadership piece, but also funding and funding for, for research, for training, um, for implementation, um, for those stakeholder convenings. And so they recommended that, that this you know, be established as a, as a permanent institute. Next slide, please. Um, running, running out of time, so I'm going to quickly go through this and won't read all the quotes, but, but really what they found is that there weren't ambulances, that they were untrained, um, and that there was no data collection, either on what these ambulances looked like or on what kind of services they had or what happened to the people who got care of these ambulances. And I think that's another place that we're recognizing now that we need more data on how our crisis services are, are, are implemented, on, on what those responses are, and we have a lot of different variations. Um, next slide, please. The, um, I thought this was interesting. So that about 50% of the, of the country's ambulances at the time were provided in purses, and there were no generally accepted standards for personnel. And then on the next slide, the, the final sort of quote that they had is a, as a recommendation, sorry, next slide, please, um, was that there also were not, this is just looking at the scope of things they were dealt with, there were no vehicles that actually could serve as ambulances. Um, and again, next slide is our last slide on, on ambulances. Then basically what they, what they concluded was that ambulance services should be as much of a responsibility as firefighting police services. Next slide, please. So, they also really found that facilities were lacking. Um, there were very few 24-hour facilities, and most facilities were not um, full-time manned by nursing or physician staff. Um, next slide, please. And so with this, the, the need for um, standardization and accreditation of facilities, which again, we're seeing on the 98 and crisis side. Um, we can advance, I think, to the, to the major takeaway slide. So this slide is about the, uh, the need. For, this is sort of interesting. It's a medical legal thing that found that there was a lack of um, really follow-up of people who were disabled after accidents and that there needs to be done both in the, in the healthcare world as well as in the legal side to support these individuals. Next slide, please. And so they identified really what we're seeing now and part of what this, you know, this crisis jam, these stakeholder groups are, showing that really this coordination at all levels is needed and these convenings are a big part of it. 
Next slide, please. Um, the Emergency Medical Services Act of, of 1973 uh, was really instrumental in standardizing and funding the EMS system that we rely on today. And there, if you, you look through these things, you'll notice that many of them are similar to what we're seeing with 988, all the way down to each state being required to have a lead agency. Um, we can advance to the, the major takeaway slide. So I feel like I got too ambitious. I thought it was a very exciting topic. Um, uh, the, uh, but ma major takeaways. So that this report, we identified the need for federal, state, and local government to, to coordinate and, and, and partner in these, in these efforts, including you know, stakeholder groups outside of government. Um, it led to the major impacts on public awareness and legislation. And the system development and standardization occurred after this legislation was passed. And then one other piece is that workforce specialization, including EMTs and paramedics um, development followed system changes rather than happening before. And so we're seeing that now in terms of uh, what we, the big workforce gaps that we have in our, our crisis response systems. Um, well, well yes. sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Thanks for keeping me on track. Well, no problem, Eric. This is so fascinating that we could dive deep, uh, I think, for multiple hours on this. And, and I will echo Sandra, like you uh, definitely are um, well versed in this and we appreciated everything that you brought uh, when you were with the representative's office and really helping um, to get uh, the 988 Implementation Act um, introduced and moved as, uh, as it did last Congress. So I am going to introduce our round table and we have Dr. Sandy Schneider uh, and Karen Larson and you can see their organizations here to just comment on uh, the presentation. And of course, uh, if there's any questions in the chat, feel free to drop them in and we will uh, try to get to as many as we can. Uh, so Dr. Schneider, I'll turn to you first for your thoughts. Yeah, so thank you, Eric. It was a wonderful presentation. And I just want to mention um, that I was in Pittsburgh and had the honor of being one of the very first uh, uh, medical physicians uh, to give medical command to Freedom House. I knew many of those people well. And I'm going to put in the chat uh, a wonderful book. Whoops, it didn't quite, I don't know what happened there. A wonderful book um, called American Sirens. Uh, which is the story of Freedom House. So a couple of things uh, I just have to add for um, uh, completeness sake. Uh, Freedom House was started by a guy by the name of Peter Sapper, who actually developed CPR as we know it. He is a story all to himself. Um, he was my mentor and my first employer. Uh, and he actually told me to go into emergency medicine. So I listened to him. Uh, Nancy Caroline was my next door neighbor. Um, and again, I knew most of the paramedics. Um, so it's been wonderful to sort of walk down memory lane with you. By the way, the uh, also the Freedom House ambulance workers were CETA workers uh, considered to be unemployable. Um, and many of them then went on to become leaders in EMS throughout the country. They certainly weren't unemployable. And again, I, rec I recommend the story, uh, American Sirens, which is the story of Freedom House. But let me just... <clears throat> mention a couple of things. <clears throat> Not only did EMS get a, um, a, a jump start uh, because it needed to and because of the, the war in Vietnam, et cetera, but also we had a television show um, that was known as Emergency with Johnny and Roy. You're all too young to know about this. Um, and there was a medical director in there, Dr. Bracken, who in real life was my other mentor, who was Ron Stewart, um, who was still alive and kicking. What is different about EMS? What can we learn? And you did a great job of summarizing this. I think one of the first things is that we're a coordinated effort across the country, which you guys are starting. But what else happened was there were standards. Uh, every ambulance started to look alike. Every paramedic started to look alike. When a paramedic brought a patient to me in Pittsburgh, when they brought him to me in uh, Texas, they were taken care of much in the same way. There, we, we kind of got rid of the, you know, well, our community is different, so we'll do it differently here. And that I think really, really, really helped. Um, we also had standards uh, and data 
Uh, and so we collected the data and then we did research in the field to show what actually worked and what didn't. Um, I think all of those things are things that, that 988 can, can look at and say, how can we replicate that? Uh, so it doesn't take us you know, 50 years uh, to uh, uh, go from a point of uh, where I was giving uh, medicine by color. I used to tell them to give green medicine or blue medicine or red medicine, literally, um, to you know, the sophisticated paramedics we have today. So again, standardization, things that you can anticipate so that while every community is different and may do a few things different, that ability to know what you're going to get when you call for services is just, uh, to me, hugely important and, and likely missing. I'll shut up now, but happy to talk more. This has been like a walk down memory lane. Oh, well, thank you, Dr. Snyder. It's so great to hear from someone who's actually worked with these individuals. So I feel like I'm getting a history lesson here because I was not aware of Freedom House. Uh, so I'm going to turn now to Karen Larson to uh, share her thoughts and feedback. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. And it's uh, interesting. I just watched the Freedom House documentary a couple of weeks ago. I was so inspired and kind of disheartened all at once about the, the story. So it's nice to have it come up here. Um, I'm the CEO of the Steinberg Institute. We're a California nonprofit public policy institute working on mental health and substance use policy. Our, um, we were founded back in 2015 by the now Sacramento mayor, Daryl Steinberg, when he left the Senate. He kind of looked behind himself and realized that nobody was prioritizing mental health policy. And uh, he had recently authored Proposition 63, which is a millionaire's tax here in California that, that generates over $4 billion in revenue for um, mental health services in California. So he had seen what could be accomplished with legislation and appropriate funding. And um, I was lucky enough to join the Institute as uh, their CEO almost a year ago. But prior to that, I worked at Yolo County, which is a little uh, county right across the river from Sacramento. We had a population of just over 200,000 people. And we're trying to figure out this, our crisis system. And um, because of our size, that was pretty challenging. And so we joined with several other counties in California to kind of learn more about the crisis now model and to think through what might work best for each of our communities. Um, we explored regional approaches for things like call centers and um, and so and and then at the local level, I was over health and human services, so social services, behavioral health, all of those things. And so I had to partner with other county departments, especially our friends with guns, my law enforcement partners, with our city partners, with our healthcare systems, with clients and family members and our university. And over the course of several months in that, uh, working through that with that group, we were able to braid together more than 18 funding streams and really come up with a vision for a comprehensive crisis response continuum in Yolo County. And so it was fortuitous that when I left Yolo County and came to the Steinberg Institute, we were working on AB 988. Um, and uh, and I got to take these learnings from my local experience and really translate them into our work on AB 988. Um, the, the name of the our bill was the Miles Hall Lifeline and Suicide Prevention Act. Um, the bill was named after Miles Hall, who lived with schizoaffective disorder. And his the day before he died, his mom called the police and said, you know, Miles is in a bad space and you might be getting some calls about him. The officer said, we understand, we know Miles were good, but the next day when callers to 911 said Miles was behaving erratically and carrying a garden tool, the police officers that arrived shouted at him, drew their weapons and fired and Miles died. So our bill is named after him as a testament to what we kind of need to fix in our uh, crisis continuum. Um, our bill 8988 did pass last year. Uh, it lays out a clear planning process for implementation to ensure high quality services across the state. It also includes a small fee on phone lines to pay for the service. Um, California was only the fifth state to pass such a fee, so we're really proud of that. And um, the fee will go towards the call centers and some of the mobile crisis response, but we really know that there is additional funding needed to support the uncovered parts of our system. And so we're advocating with our state to allocate ongoing sustainable funding for the other pieces of our crisis continuum, like crisis receiving centers. And really our vision is that everyone has someone to call and someone to come and somewhere to go. And um, just really honored to be here today. And thank you so much for letting me share. 
Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, Karen. And, and I just want to thank all of our uh, roundtable and speakers, Eric, Dr. Schneider, um, Karen. And, and, you know, I also want to highlight uh, the work of the Steinberg Institute, the Kennedy Forum, uh, in the passage of AB 988. I know that was a, a big two-year effort. Um, and so really want to thank you all for the work that you've done. And uh, one of the things that I noticed, in addition to standardization that came from this presentation, is also, um, and I don't know much about Freedom House, I'm sorry, and I will look into that, but it's this notion that the communities, right, like this seemed to have come from the communities. Let's let's uh, support the communities to, to provide what they need. And then again, standardize and, and make it happen. It's not always top down. Um, actually top down is sometimes the least effective. Uh, Dr. Snyder, did you wanna say something? I just have to add one other little thing. Uh, every ambulance you see right now has lights on its side, right? They have a flat top and lights on the side. In the past, when I started in medicine, they had bubble tops, you know, with a little thing on the top. The reason for those lights on the side was the fact that the hospital I worked in had, a, they had to go in a garage and we kept knocking off those lights. So they put the lights on the side and those have become standard. You do not see many uh, ambulances right now with bubble tops. Uh, and the reason is Montefiore Hospital couldn't uh, accommodate those. Yes. So what do you that, that's a good little tidbit. Let's keep that in mind as we yeah. go to our next segment and think about the hot seat. Uh, Cause that sounds like something that could be a future hot seat question, right? <laughs> Um, yes, Karen. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Before we get to the hot seat, just quickly, uh, again, you can go to samsa.gov slash find help slash 988 slash partner toolkit. Uh, they have posters, magnets, stickers, uh, wallet cards. You can order up to 326 items for free. Uh, there may be a bit of a, a backlog. We've heard some from some folks that uh, they're waiting on an order from September, but you know what, this is still great. Make sure that you are putting your order in and we are sharing uh, and talking about 988 in the community. Let's keep going. And of course you have your t-shirt, uh, long sleeve, short sleeve, you can get your hats, you have your choice of quote, uh, colors and logos. This is available uh, through the talk.crisisnow.com website. Uh, you can order a shirt, get them for Valentine's Day, as Amy has mentioned. Or if we go forward, you can get one for participating in the hot seat, uh, as I mentioned. And so I'm going to ask uh, Ruchi Su. Sukaja, and I apologize if I have uh, butchered your name, uh, and you are our featured hot seat participant for today. Hi, Laura. How are you? I'm well. How are you feeling? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Well, no pressure. I, I, should, be, I should be saying I'm feeling hot. <laughs> <laughs> but that's right, because uh, David has turned up the heat on these questions absolutely, lately. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so your question, and let me set the scene for a little bit. Okay. Uh, in 1966, as we heard from Eric, the accidental death and disability uh, paper described the components of a modern modern emergency medical system. So first aid, 911, ambulances, and accessible hospital emergency departments uh, that would save countless lives. What example did the authors use to suggest that the U.S. could do far better? So there are the four options here are the earthquake, uh, disaster response, Grady Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia, London's cholera epidemic, or the battlefront Vietnam. So talk it through. <laughs> talk it through. I think I was not born in 1966, so I'm just going to rely on um, guesswork here, deductive reasoning. Um, 1966, emergency medical systems, I would say maybe London's um, or earthquake, pr probably. Um, but yes, I'll rely on audience and um, get to have their help. Uh, Michael, ask a friend, of course. Um, Michael worked at uh, Grady Hospital, Atlanta, Georgia. I um, did work at Grady and not in the 60s, but I'm pretty sure it could be Vietnam, Ruchi. Okay. All right. That matches Michael. the audience at 49%. Audience are also suggesting that, so I'm going to go with my friend 
and audience. So I'll go with option D, Laura. All right, let's see. Drum roll, please. Let's see if the audience and your phone a friend was correct. There we go, Battlefront Vietnam. <laughs> 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 Yay. I also did a similar uh, process of elimination, having not been around in 1966. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things that we learned uh, and it's pulled from the paper is that quote on screen. Uh, I won't read it to you, but Ruchi, uh, any final words for your hot seat experience? Uh, hot. Well, it was wonderful. And uh, I could just rely on friends and audience. So anytime, you know, I'll be happy to be on the hot seat. I feel good among the audience and the friends. That's thank right. you, Michael. Thank you, everybody. Give her that shirt. You left out the shirt. Yes, well, I am wearing 988 shirt. So, you know, a yes. Whole, yes. Time to get a hat. Let's add the hat to the collection. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's add the hat. Well, thank you for having me. No problem. Thank you for being a part of the hot seat. And again, anyone can volunteer. Uh, please reach out to Karen, but the heat is over for now. We will move forward <laughs> and I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie Hepburn. Thanks, Laura. Um, so I'd like to welcome Luanna Murphy. She's the CEO of Exodus Recovery. And Luanna, can you tell us about Safe Landing in Los Angeles County and what makes it different from other transitional housing? Oh, can't quite hear you. That's because I couldn't find the unmute button. Oh. That I did. <laughs> this, this marvelous, beautiful facility just opened about two and a half weeks ago. And Stephanie, Stephanie and I talked about it, I don't know, a month ago, six weeks ago, yeah. something like that. And mm -hmm. I said, you know, let, let, let's wait to publish this and let's wait for me to talk about it until we actually get this place opened. This has been a, a three-year journey that I expected to be a one-year journey. Um, people in LA County asked Exodus to please build this on county property. They funded it and it should be easy because it's county property and the county is really gonna cooperate with the builder and we're gonna get the permitting process done really quickly. And, and anyway, it took three years. It should have taken about one year but we did have this little thing in addition to superimposed on the normal bureaucracy, mm -hmm. we did have this little pandemic thing superimposed on this. Anyway, it was worth the wait. I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about it and I hope to come back and talk to you after it's been open for a few months and we've really got some data on it. It is very unique except the services within it are not unique. Everybody's got some of this. It is a shelter, it's interim housing, it's recoup care beds, it's sobering beds. It also has an FQHC on site. It's connected to a mental health crisis receiving center as we, in, in call, them, we call them emerging care centers in, in LA County through telehealth. So, what is unique about this is, first of all, it's on three acres. There's plenty of outdoor space for folks to wander around in. Mm -hmm. You can access this 24 hours a day. I don't know about in the rest of the country, but in Los Angeles County, many if you go to a shelter, you have to leave in the morning and come back at night and get readmitted and so forth. That is not the case here. There's access 24 seven. Our outreach teams can bring people, our law enforcement can bring people, just mental health agencies or homeless agencies can bring people here. So it is not strictly mental health. It is really for our homeless population. We all know that a large percentage of our homeless population are homeless because of mental illness. The statistics tell us that about 30% have mental illness. Our anecdotal experience will tell you it's, it's a lot higher than that. And we, as I said, we've been open for two and a half weeks. We had 13 admissions on our first day. Mm -hmm. 
25 the next day, then it was 50. This morning, it's 150. Growing. That is an enormous, quick ramp up. And of course, the staff thinks that they've been, feels like they've been drinking from a fire hose because they have. But the response from the community has been overwhelming. And I, I really have high hopes that we're going to pay attention to this model. And of course, it's, we're, we're, not going to, we're not going to have gotten it perfectly correct this first time, but there's a lot about it that is correct. We bring somebody in when they knock on the door. That door's never closed. We never say, no, you can't come in. That's a real challenge when the need is so great, but we are going to meet that challenge. We have social work staff that is very experienced in moving people from a shelter bed to an interim housing bed to permanent supportive housing. That of course can take many months, but we are going to be working on that process to ensure that we can move people from here into something more permanent before we move them into something really permanent. We've got to keep this pipeline, if you will, going. My husband, Dr. David Murphy, who founded Exodus with me 30 some years ago, said to me years ago, you cannot expect somebody to pay attention to the, what medication they need or what other things that they need if they don't know where they're going to sleep tonight. So we at Exodus have been dedicated to, we've got to provide a place to go. We have got to provide a place for them to sleep. Yes, we need crisis receiving centers. This safe landing is in my view, and I hope it is going to continue to be part of the crisis receiving process because it is functioning with the SAMHSA guidelines. Yes, you can come in at any time. Yes, we can get you what you need. Yes, we're going to find a place for you to go. And by the way, you can bring your dog or your cat and we have private spaces where you can lock your, your belongings up. We try to eliminate all the barriers that people put up to getting off the street. So this morning, I can tell you it is a very robust campus with people wandering around with their dogs and talking to each other. And it's a fabulous, fabulous facility. And I hope to talk about it again when I've really got more to tell you about what the outcomes are. Thank you so much for joining us. In the article, Luana also talks about how it can become replicable. So please take a look. Thanks, Laura. Sending it Thanks, back to Stephanie. you. Yeah, no problem. Great uh, work going on in California. So again, talk.crisisnow.com to view that article. Let's keep going. And I'm going to turn it over to a friend, uh, Eduardo Vega, to give us a, a lived lens experience. Eduardo, are you with us right now? Hi there. Hello, Laura. Um, Good to meet everyone. Good to see you. Good to see a lot of friends here. Um, I <clears throat> I wanted to talk about specifically today, sort of the the work of integrating lived experience into the service array. Um, in uh, under 988 and with the expansion of crisis services around the country, this is a really important This is a really important time to do this. Uh, and the opportunity and the importance of it, uh, I think, are difficult to uh, overstate. You know, as people on this call know very well, this is a transformational moment. And one of the things that I would like to add to the kind of list of things that we would want, um, someone to call, someplace to go, et cetera, is someone who can say, I've been there. This is a, a big uh, difference and a big shift. And as many of you know, it's been, uh, developing for many years across our mental health systems, various providers, et cetera, uh, many organizations, uh, including, uh, you know, on this call, um, implementing peer-based services, peer support, um, and slowly, I would suggest, but uh, to an increasing degree, 
uh, valuing lived experience in the ability to respond to uh, people in their worst moments. So at Humanovations, um, our trainings have really focused on this particular area, uh, crisis ally training as an example we've provided in um, Illinois to uh, um, hundreds of 988 providers there through their state legislation, um, bringing a peer-based model to support uh, and particularly engagement. Um, so when we talk about people in the mobile crisis, mobile outreach area as an example, this is the perfect opportunity um, because it is pretty powerful. And, and I will say it's sort of from my personal lived experience, um, even though I had intersection with an interaction with my mental health providers in the time I was young, uh, substance abuse providers, etc. Um, when I uh, had was living with my most intense uh, suicidal intensity, um, it was connecting with somebody else who had been there, uh, a friend who had, uh, you know, pretty visible recent uh, scars on his wrist, and also the opportunity to help others that made a difference. Those were the things that transformed my life from one of um, suffering and kind of constant suicidal intensity to direction and connection. Direction and connection, purpose, meaning, um, and being seen as an equal and a gift to the community are the essence of the lived experience peer support model and the things that we can bring to uniquely make this change, not just one that does more for more people, but that meets people where they are um, in the spirit of compassion uh, and helps connect people to what they need on their worst days in their lives. Thank you for letting me share and I appreciate uh, the time today. I'm gonna post here a registration link for our, um, <coughs> our community collo colloquium on this subject, specifically how to integrate peer and lived experience into crisis services. We had our first uh, webinar the other day uh, and we'd love to see more of you there. I can present more on the information we received as well. Thanks. Well, thank you, Eduardo. Um, so folks will be looking forward to that in the chat uh, and other ways to um, receive those trainings. So thank you for that. And then we are going to move forward uh, for a brief um, discussion uh, from the data corner. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Matt Goldman. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our first data corner of 2023. And I'm really excited to be joined um, by my friend and colleague, Dr. Sosomolu Shoyinka, to describe a new uh, report that came out from the National Council Medical Directors Institute um, Committee on Crisis Services that he and I have the pleasure of co-chairing together. Um, Dr. Shoyinka, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you, Matt, for um, that kind introduction. Thank you also to uh, the Crisis Gen Leads for the opportunity, and thank you to the National Council. So uh, I have just a few minutes to talk about this, but essentially uh, the National Council rec and the MDI Institute recognized that there was a, an opportunity in, in the crisis space with all the developments that have been ongoing for the last several years to really define, uh, put some definition around the use and selection of, of uh, crisis metrics. Now, this is at least in part due to the recognition that what gets, got, what gets measured gets done. And it's really impossible to manage a system, systems at the level of complexity, such as our crisis systems without having some means to measure performance. And so, um, uh, just a really quick walk through the, it's a, it's, it's a really, brief documents, it's easy to read, but what's rec what's uh, what's included in there are uh, a description of different kinds of metrics. So structural process outcomes, clinical metrics, uh, satisfactions, uh, 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 measuring satisfaction and efficiency and so on. But uh, it's, it's one of the other exciting pieces is this report is really incorporates the thinking around how to have metrics reflect your values as a system. Uh, this is something that we've done extensively uh, here in Philadelphia, and, uh, and but the, the, this paper talks about it. I think the real, the heart of the um, paper really is the person, it's the um, access to help. It's, it's the recognition that metrics must be person-centered and it, it's captured in the acronym 
uh, access to help, which uh, I know Matt just posted in the chat a link to the document, and you can read that further. And the, the, the paper concludes with a very well-written section on complexity, uh, again, a recognition that it's not easy to, these are not straightforward, simple systems, but really requires to think through complexity. And so I'd like to conclude by thanking Matt for your uh, co-leadership and, and every other member of our committee for their work on this important document. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your work on this. And as always, I'm just sharing here a couple data corner bites. Um, there are a lot of publications coming out right now about crisis services, including an entire volume of the journal Focus that had many really interesting articles on emergency psychiatry. Um, I'll post that link in the chat, as well as a couple other articles that are um, sort of commentaries talking about 988. So definitely seeing this topic uh, penetrate into the academic literature, which has been um, really good to see to spread the word. Uh, also, research funding, the NIMH uh, notice of special interest on priority research opportunities and crisis response services turned one year old today. Um, this opportunity is still available and really helps emphasize uh, this NIMH priority to continue to study and expand our evidence base for crisis services. Um, so just wanted to uh, highlight that and I'll hand it back to Laura. Thank you so much. Thank you both. I think we we're just speaking about the need for quality measures uh, and more data. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to SAMHSA, and I believe we have Dr. John Palmieri. Thanks, Laura. Um, going to share the SAMHSA time with Richard, so I'm going to just be very brief and provide a couple of quick uh, updates. Uh, one related to um, the recent lifeline outage. Um, so uh, on January 26, the FCC, uh, as many of you know, met move to forward proposed uh, to propose rules related to outage notification for the 988 lifeline. Um, as you, many of you know, and this was um, publicized as well, the lifelines uh, telephone provider experienced a cybersecurity incident early in December uh, that caused uh, calls to be uh, down for, uh, for several hours. Uh, part of the FCC uh, action uh, is related to what exists for the 911 system because there are currently reporting requirements in place for 911. So this FCC notice would um, bring similar requirements uh, for the 988 lifeline. Uh, once it's published, there'll be an opportunity for public comment uh, and the proposed rules uh, would uh, essentially require 988 service providers to report outages that potentially uh, affect 988 service, which hopefully would hasten service restoration enable officials to inform the public of alternate ways to contact the lifeline. So more to come on that. Uh, additionally, as many of you know, there's legislative activity happening uh, related to cybersecurity. And then from an operations standpoint, obviously a tremendous amount of work with SAMHSA, Fibrant, and other partners um, to uh, support um, uh, security uh, and building of redundancies uh, to uh, mitigate uh, risks uh, moving forward. And then I just want to briefly just mention, as many of you saw last night, State of the Union address where the president did spend some time lifting up mental health needs uh, across the country uh, and then will attach, if it has not been attached already, the fact sheet from the White House, which uh, essentially uses some of the framing that has been used before related to creating healthy environments, uh, supporting, uh, protecting youth. Uh, online is one example, that connection to care where a lot of references to crisis care in the 988 uh, lifeline um, have been referenced and then building capacity, um, specifically calling out uh, the minority fellowship program as an area uh, where we could continue to build capacity. So I'm going to stop there and then pass it off to Richard for any uh, quick comments that he might have. Thank you, John. I'll be really quick. First, I want to take a moment to uh... Uh, recognize my friend and colleague Eduardo Vega, and you know there wasn't an opportunity to do an extensive uh, review of some of his accomplishments. But if you're not aware, Eduardo was the first head of the Consumer and Survivor um, uh, Committee for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Was part of one of the first uh, documents for suicide attempt uh, survivors that also came out uh, from. Uh, the lifeline. It was also the driving force behind the Action Alliance um, um, 
uh, effort, the way forward, looking to really incorporate the, the voices of people with lived experience more systematically in suicide prevention and crisis services across the country. So great to hear from you, Eduardo. Um, also, I mean, another fantastic uh, crisis jam. I think that, you know, the history around EMS is certainly instructive. SAMHSA's original report to the FCC envisioned that a three-digit number could play a similar role in the transformation of behavioral crisis services that 911 did for the development of EMS. And it was great to, to hear that systematically rolled out. And then finally, um, the uh, uh, Suicide Awareness Voices of Education organization, uh, SAVE, uh, has recently posted uh, 2021 suicide prevention data, uh, suicide data rather, um, including the state by state reports uh, uh, by then by age, by um, uh, race, gender, ex method, et cetera. It's a very handy document. Quick caveat, it's not age adjusted the way the CDC is, but it is a very user friendly document. And if you look at the past 10 years breakout by age, you can see how for younger people, the trend line has really been going in particular in the wrong direction, something that really requires our continuing attention. So uh, thank you, John. Well, and thank you, Richard, uh, and thank you, John. Uh, I'm going to keep us moving forward, but if you all want to put in the chat links to that information that you just shared, Richard, I think that sounds like an interesting paper. Um, and again, my apologies to uh, Eduardo. Uh, yes, very accomplished. Uh, and so I'm um, glad that we got that in there. So I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Dr. Deb Pinals to give us an update from NashBed. Well, hello, thank you, and I'll be super quick. Um, hi, everybody. This was a great crisis jam, and just want to highlight the Lending Hands paper that was written by Nashbid uh, on uh, behalf of SAMHSA that really highlights where we're at. Keep, we can keep going. We're at a monumental time when we look at the history of how 911 evolved. We're right there with 988. Um, we know that there was this evo evolution in medical care. And uh, we're seeing this evolution in, in behavioral health care. And uh, we are moving beyond thinking about what used to be, whether medical workers would go or hospital workers would go to police, to now thinking about behavioral health, thinking about how we maximally engage people in treatment and how we define crisis, how the individuals define crisis more broadly so we can get ahead of the crisis. Uh, lots going on federally and locally looking at 911 and 988 to think about that and using those lessons from the past. Next slide. And we really have an opportunity with the, the three sort of a three thinking about the three legged stool and getting behavioral health responders of all types when we're when we can and when appropriate and building out those protocols, but not forgetting our partners EMS and law enforcement who are still involved in some of this crisis uh, continuum and really looking at how do we maximize, again, engagement and safe safety for all uh, while we are fostering uh, people's recovery. Next slide. So there's lots of opportunities on the horizon. We're getting more sophisticated and informed. There's more research that needs to be done. And we need to keep caring for the workforce that's uh, providing these services as dispatch makes very important triage, triage decisions. I would encourage you to look at that Lending Hands paper that talks about uh, the three different responders and how we can really keep moving the needle to get uh, with the 911-988 interface, get that rollout of behavioral health response. And next slide. And just remind you that we have a whole compendium of papers talking about from crisis to care to keep us moving in the right direction. And thank you all for your great work and partnership. That's it for me, Laura. Well, thank you, Deb. And I'm going to move us because we are right at the top of the hour. I think this has been a really packed jam. We covered some of the State of the Union and we don't unfortunately have time for the state updates. But I do want to highlight that a lot of what we talked about here, allowing the community to have space, um, standardization, that involves policy. Uh, right now, all 50 states are 
in session. Um, so let's think about how we can translate some of this from research and smaller communities into best practices, policies across the nation. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for your time today. Uh, and please make sure that you are reaching out uh, and talking with those in your community who are uh, doing this work directly. All right, thank you all.